Welcome, Ben Mama. This video is brought to you by A Compendium of Atari 2600 Games Volume 1 by Kieran Hawken and AG Books. This full colour book features over 250 game reviews, fun facts and trivia, personal stories and is the ultimate companion to Atari's iconic console. It is available in both hardback and paperback and can be purchased worldwide from all leading bookstores including Amazon, WH Smiths, Waterstones, Barnes & Noble and Wordery. So what are you waiting for? Get your copy today! We all know about the Atari 2600 video computer system, that iconic wood grain fascia, the classic games like Combat, Space Invaders and Yars Revenge, the famous CX40 joystick and that magical hand drawn box art. It was the system that truly kickstarted the video game industry and with sales of over 30 million units worldwide it's no surprise that it's still so fondly remembered. But a lot less people talk about the Atari 2600 Junior the 1986 relaunch of the console with its sleek modern design, shiny silver strip and vast cost reductions. Aimed at a younger more budget conscious audience it was mocked by some of the gaming press upon its arrival but ended up being a huge success for Atari especially in PAL regions. So for the latest episode in my amazing facts series I thought it was time to shine the spotlight on the Atari 2600 Junior. Not just a remodelled version of Atari's best selling system, but also the first Atari I ever owned, meaning it has a huge amount of nostalgia for me personally, and indeed I talked about this when I reviewed the system itself, so click the link in the top right hand corner or the description if you want to see that. And now it's time to get on with the show and talk about 10 amazing Atari 2600 Junior facts. The fun is back, oh yes siree, it's the 2600 from Atari, it's the video system with classics galore, from space invaders to cars that roar, a real hip joystick controls the screen, Solaris is hot and midnight magic's mean, and one more thing, it's got a special low price, under 50 bucks, 50 bucks, now isn't that nice, the fun is back, oh yes siree, it's the 2600 from Atari. It's the 2600 from Atari. Probably the first fact we should examine here is where the junior part of the name came from, because as you are probably aware, it never actually appeared on any of the advertising or packaging. Although the code number and original name for this new model was actually the Atari 2200, the internal nickname was the junior. This was for two reasons. Firstly because it was to be a younger and smaller brother to the 2600 VCS. Not many people know that there was also a redesigned and cost reduced 5200 super system known as the 5200 Junior along the same lines of thinking too, but this never made it to market. The second reason for this name was that the 2600 Junior was designed to appeal to young children with its cheap price and simpler games when compared to the then market leading Nintendo NES and Atari's new 7800 Pro system. Warner Atari also developed a series of new games based on popular cartoon characters such as Bugs Bunny, Donald Duck and Garfield to appeal to this new more youthful audience. Interestingly none of these games would ever make it into production under the Trammell owned Atari Corp as the licensing costs were deemed too high for a budget price console. It's the 2600 from Atari. It's interesting to note that the Junior wasn't Atari's first attempt to cost reduce and downsize the 2600. An early attempt was made some years before in the form of the Atari 2000. In the early years of the system the management at Atari were utterly convinced that the lack of huge widespread success was down to the high cost of the console and tasked their engineers with trying to find a way to make it cheaper. The obvious way to do this was by giving it a lower cost aesthetic as there was no way of actually reducing the price of the hardware inside. This project was codenamed VAL with the objective to create an all-in-one system with built-in controllers and a lot more cheap plastic instead of metal and wood. This long unit which was eventually called the Atari 2000 features built-in controllers on both sides that would work as both a joystick and paddles in a very clever design indeed, as well as the usual switches in the middle and a cartridge port on the back. 
This unit was redesigned a few times and renamed the 2500 before Atari cancelled the project altogether after the cost of parts in the original model started to come down and the release of Space Invaders saw the original VCS become the huge success story they envisaged. It's the 2600 from Atari. This next entry very much leads on from the last one because although the sleek designs of the 2600 Junior are very much seen as a product of Tramalera Atari, the Junior project was actually started under the stewardship of Warner Brothers, with the design of the cost reduced Atari 2000, as I already mentioned. But the Junior was also a Warner product too, one that was originally due for release in 1984, alongside the new more advanced Atari 7800 Pro system, but more on that later. The internal turmoil at Atari that eventually saw the consumer division sold to Jack Tramiel was very much responsible for the Junior's release being delayed. Warner Atari had actually returned to a previously unused design for inspiration, but not one of its own. Famous toy manufacturers Milton Bradley were also marketing the rival Vectrix console at this time and designed the prototype voice commander module for Atari based on a similar unit produced for the TI-99 home computer. Although it had been advertised in catalogues and shown to the press, Atari never put this into production, but they liked the case so much they returned to it for the 2600 Junior project. Regan Cheng had previously designed a mock-up for the 2600 Junior based on the looks of the 1200XL computer to match it up with the existing home computer line, but Atari's own Mark Biasotti then merged this design with Milton Bradley's to create the look for the final production model. Interestingly, the Junior itself was actually redesigned several times too, albeit marginally. There are both the short and long rainbow versions, with the latter being more common in power regions and the former in North America, as well as the eye-catching Black Irish, so called because it was exclusively manufactured by Atari Europe in Tipperary Island, and this dumped the iconic silver strip for a dark mode design aesthetic. This is also the rarest and most sought after variation of the Junior. It's the 2600 from Atari. Upon his acquisition of the Atari Consumer Division, Jack Trammell set about plans to revive the Atari 2600 Junior project to help shift the masses of inventory they were sitting on and help kickstart the video games division. Despite many misquoted stories claiming otherwise, it was always Jack's intention to have both the home computer and home entertainment divisions. After the hugely successful launch of the 16-bit Atari ST computer, Jack started to put his plans for the new division in place by hiring Michael Katz from Epix in November 1985. Katz would take up the role of president in the new Entertainment Electronics division, and he soon set about recruiting developers to produce games for the relaunched 2600 as well as the 7800. Katz had quite a pedigree in the industry, having pioneered electronic handheld games while working at Coleco and launching their popular ColecoVision console. Previous to joining Atari, he had also transformed Epix from a struggling strategy game publisher into one of the biggest software houses in the world, so he was the perfect man for the job, and very much contributed to the huge success of the Atari 2600 Junior on a very small budget. After leaving Atari Corporation, Mike Katz proved that Genesis does what Nintendo don't, as the president of Sega America, only adding to his amazing legacy in the video games industry. It's the 2600 from Atari. From day one, a key part of the design aesthetic for the 2600 Junior was the packaging. Atari envisioned that it would come in as small a box as possible to match its small form factor, with a handle on the top to make it somewhat portable just like a lunchbox. This would mean that you could carry it around to your friend's house, take it on holiday, or even just carry it around the house easily, for those who could only use their console on the big TV at weekends, like me when I was younger. I can't say I ever saw anyone carrying an Atari 2600 Junior down the street, but I imagine it would have been a good bit of advertising for anyone that did. Atari did actually do a package in a much larger box later on with two Atari 7800 Proline joysticks instead of the regular CX40s, but this sold nowhere near as well, which certainly tells you something. The red and silver lunchbox juniors are much more common and arguably a lot cooler too. It's the 2600 from Atari. Though the 2600 Junior was widely available in high street stores, electronics giants, toy shops and all the places you'd expect to find video game consoles, Atari very much had a defined plan of action when it came to marketing the remodelled system. 
This involved heavily targeting home shopping catalogues, both in North America and Europe. By doing this, they put the console firmly in the eyes of parents looking for gifts, especially for younger children who don't necessarily know what they want. The compact design, low price and wide range of recognisable games made the 2600 Junior instantly appealing. Another huge benefit of promoting the system through catalogues was the availability of credit. A lot of low income families would use home shopping catalogues to buy all their Christmas gifts and then pay them off in instalments. The low price of the console itself as well as its games made it particularly attractive to this demographic. Indeed, Atari UK marketing manager Daryl Steele has confirmed in interviews that the vast majority of UK sales to the Atari 2600 Junior came from these catalogues. And the famous 32 in 1 cartridge was created with this in mind to make the Junior even better value for money still. It's the 2600 from Atari. By the time the 2600 Junior came along, the pause feature had become pretty standard on consoles. Interestingly, the first system to utilise such a feature was actually Atari's replacement for the 2600, the 5200. But of course, the then nearly 10 year old VCS hardware had no such feature, but the clever programmers who were now aiming their games at the Junior came up with very well thought out solutions to this problem. One of the standard features of the original Atari 2600 was the colour switch, which allowed you to adjust the screen display to suit black and white TVs, which is what many kids had in their bedrooms back in the late 70s and early 80s. But by 1986, small colour TVs were very much more commonplace, and the switch had become somewhat redundant. So instead of switching the display, programmers came up with a piece of code that paused the game instead when the switch was moved into a different position. Amongst the new games that utilised this feature were Xenophobe, Super Football, Secret Quest, Sentinel and Off the Wall. It's the 2600 from Atari. As already mentioned, the 2600 Junior was very much designed to complement the new, more advanced Atari 7800 Pro system. It featured a very similar design aesthetic, shared advertising space and was very much promoted as a budget alternative to the technically superior NES rival. This also meant that many games would be released for both the 2600 and 7800, even though the latter was fully backwards compatible. It wasn't just Atari who did this either, as third party publishers like Epix, Absolute Entertainment and Activision would also do separate 2600 and 7800 versions of the same games. Hence why we saw two separate Atari versions of titles like Winter Games, Double Dragon, Xenophobe, Akari Warriors, Kung Fu Master, Commando and Dark Chambers. The other big change was the reissue of old games with stickers on the box promoting the 7800 backwards compatibility, as well as new 2600 titles, but also named the Pro System on the box too. It's the 2600 from Atari. In order to try and keep up with the competition and stop the new version of the 2600 looking woefully dated, Atari had to pull some pretty big tricks out of the bag. These included adding extra memory to cartridges, creating new more advanced development systems that utilised all the known programming tricks, and upping the maximum ROM size of the cartridges to a massive 32K. In comparison, the very first Atari 2600 games were just 2K in size. Back in 2016, I interviewed veteran programmer Steve DeFrisco for a Retro Gamer magazine article on the 2600 Junior and he described the differences between the old setup and the new development platform provided by Atari Corp. They provided new game development platforms with all the documentation that was then available, along with some example code. Included in this was a six character kernel that was used to display six numbers on a single line for scores etc. The extra RAM and ROM they provided was also a big help in writing more complicated and larger games on the 2600 too. In fact, I produced a video showing the huge evolution of the Atari 2600 from those early titles to the very last commercial releases. So if you want to have a look at those staggering differences in more detail, then click the link in the top right hand corner or description. It's the 2600 from Atari. It's fair to say that Atari well and truly milked the 2600 until it was dry and the new version of Atari very much seemed to be doing the same thing with their endless re-releases of the same old games in different forms. The 2600 Junior massively prolonged the life of a system that had already been replaced three times by 1987, 
and this meant that it wasn't actually discontinued officially until 1992, giving it the longest commercial lifespan of any console ever, an incredible 15 years. Although the PlayStation 2 and Xbox 360 both ended up running it pretty close. The record continues to stand and probably will forever. Some people even say that the Atari 2600 is the only console to become retro within its own lifetime. And for comparison, it's interesting to note that in 1992, Atari themselves released the advanced 32-bit Falcon computer. Commodore launched their own 32-bit system in the Amiga A1200, and just a year later, new 32-bit consoles would arrive too, like the 3DO, CD32 and FM Town Smarty, as well as, of course, Atari's own 64-bit Jaguar, the very last true Atari system. The fun is back! As you can see, with the 2600 from Atari. Still under 50 bucks, but wait, there's more. There's a stack of new games at the video store. In real sports boxing, the action's rough. If you're gonna make it, you got to be tough. Midnight Magic is an arcade blast. Like a pinball wizard, you got to be fast. Fire Solaris to protect your base. Then blast off into hyperspace. The fun is back, oh yes sirree. New 2600 games from Atari. And that rounds up my look at 10 amazing Atari 2600 Junior facts. Which of these fabulous facts was your favourite? Or can you think of any tantalising tidbits of trivia that I didn't include? I always love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get typing in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Mitchell Valentino, Neptune, Sethe Robinson, Carl Olsen, Dos Gamerman, Noel Saw, Aussie B, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to host extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the lad, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.